But hi, everybody. I'm Kevin Sikowski, and I may, boy, I don't know if I know everybody on the call. I almost know everybody. And I'm a professor at the University of Toledo in the Department of Geography and Planning, and I'm also the PI of the Mission Earth uh, Globe Grant through NASA. And today's our first Mission Earth uh, webinar for the fall, and we're going to talk about the eclipse, the solar eclipse, and then also um, the Urban Heon field campaign, which we're going to kick off. So, oh, I have to share my screen. See, I always forget stuff. Uh, whatever. We're, we're not polished actors here. <laughs> okay, so I think you can see my screen. Hopefully, you can. <clears throat> yes. So, uh, just a little bit about Mission Earth, uh, funded by NASA, and it's a collaboration between the University of Toledo, Boston University, UC Berkeley and West Ed, Tennessee State, and NASA Langley. And we're affecting people, uh, students, um, all the way from K to graduate students, and then also uh, reaching out to the public as well, and bringing a Globe and NASA into the classroom. And so I got this picture of me and Rick. We're our speakers today. And I'm going to talk about the solar eclipse and then um, get, have Rick talk about the uh, Urban Heon uh, campaign and how he works with his students. And then I'll say a few more words about it. Uh, so well, you know, why are we doing this? So we, we have GLOBE has a virtual science symposia. So we want kids to do projects. And so the virtual science symposia, here we have the 2018 already um, announced and presentations and reports are due, it looks like March 1st. Okay, so you can have your students work on projects and post them to the symposia. And then the US Globe Regional Science Symposia, we've had two years of these. And they're broken up by region across the U.S. There's six regions. And Jennifer Bourgeau got another uh, grant from NASA to uh, fund students to go to the regional symposia, uh, targeting underrepresented groups and uh, teachers who haven't done projects with GLOBE before. And then lastly, I wanted to mention, you know, students can present at the GLOBE annual meeting which this year is going to be in Ireland. And so if they start raising money now, uh, I think it's going to be beautiful. This is where Tony uh, Murphy is from. And I think it'll be a fun time. It's July 4th week. Um, I don't know if it's July 1st or what, what week it, you know, what days it is exactly, but it's that July 4th week. All right. So uh, everybody knows we had an eclipse. <laughs> um, Actually, some people didn't know even the day of, apparently in Toledo. Uh, they were asking, why does everybody have these glasses on? But these are my two kids. We were in Kentucky along the totality. We got to go down there. And uh, well, the question we were going to try to answer is how is the weather being changed by the eclipse? And there are some research papers already published, uh, one from, or a couple from the Great Britain on the weather impacts. And so what I'll talk about today is uh, surface temperature, let's see, air temperature and clouds. Uh, over 4,000 people took air temperature and cloud observations during the eclipse. Uh, surface temperature, we had you know, fewer locations, but was over 30, and I'll show you that. And then uh, there were kites being flown to do atmospheric soundings, and that was David, David Bilowski's group out of uh, Michigan. And then there was also a whole group of people along totality launching high altitude balloons. NASA was flying planes uh, under the eclipse. I mean, all kinds of great stuff going on. And then we'll focus on the, uh, the globe part. So uh, this was provided by Travis Anderson. He's a globe implementation office person. And uh, showing the uh, use of globe observer and you can see how uh, it was launched in 2016, so uh, just about a year ago. And then you can see little blips in its usage, but then 
uh, the eclipse was a, it eclipsed all other observations. And the number of distinct users was over 4,000, taking over 20,000 observations. And it was just really uh, successful. And this is what the data look like. And some of you probably have seen this graphic already. You can see the line of totality. A lot of people along totality took observations, uh, but also in the Eastern US and in the West Coast, lots of observations being taken. I mean, I was surprised uh, where I was in Western Kentucky. Uh, I was trying to find some data recently, well, for today, uh, the data I took, and I had trouble figuring out which uh, dot I was because <laughs> There were so many observations in this rural area of Kentucky. I mean, who would figure, right? But it's great, wonderful thing. So this is what it looks like zooming into uh, like Kentucky area. Uh, clouds, again, uh, wonderful, very really long totality, lots of observations. Um, do have a lot of people putting that was obscured, I think. That's what the dark gray represents, so it's kind of an error, I suppose. Oh, one thing I should mention about the air temperature. I did find out from like a, you know, one of the observers, just a person, that what they were doing was they were going on another app on their phone to get the air temperature. So basically, um, I would imagine a lot of people may, may have done this. Instead of having an actual thermometer to take the air temperature, they just use an app on their phone and basically got the air temperature from the nearest airport. So that's something just to be aware of. I, you know, I'm not sure how that will impact the observations. And then here's the surface temperature observations. And as I mentioned, um, uh, you know, fewer locations. I can see many of you on this call took observations and that's great. And thank you for doing that. Uh, I'm this uh, dot here in Kentucky. I took two sites. But what we had done was we provided the Citizen Kate project, that's a, that was an eclipse pro project, uh, instruments along totality, and you can see those uh, sites that took observations and got them on the GLOBE website. So, you know, it wasn't just taking observations, but it's getting them on the website that was part of it. Uh, I know a number of locations uh, still haven't gotten their data on the GLOBE website yet. So uh, the graphs I'll show you were put together by Ishfaq Rahman. He's a student at the University of Toledo. He just actually started a few weeks ago. So, um, and he really knows his way around Excel, I'll tell you that. Uh, so these, this is what he did. He broke up the data by um, areas like Nebraska, Kentucky and Tennessee, and then Ohio. To kind of look at the data. Uh, you know, this is not a finished product by any means. Um, you know, it's just an initial cut through the data. We have air temperature, surface temperature, and clouds. <clears throat> so here's uh, Nebraska. So what he did was he averaged all the sites in Nebraska, and he has the air temperature and the surface temperature uh, shown here. And um, what you see is the, you know, decrease in temperature over time. Uh, in the middle is the eclipse totality, uh, right here in the middle or maximum of the eclipse. And uh, I'll just say that this is fairly typical. The air temperature seemed to change about three to four degrees Celsius uh, during the eclipse, and then surface temperature up to about 10 degrees Celsius uh, with some of the changes. Now the clouds, uh, okay, it was harder to interpret. <laughs> So on this graphic, the red line, oh, let's see, I have to move my, the people here so I can actually see it. That's scattered, and the blue is clear. So you can see how when uh, the scat uh, scattered observations went up, clear observations went down. So that means that's, there's more clouds, less clouds, more clouds. Well, let's see. Well, actually, overcast went up. So it, it's a little more complicated. So... Uh, let's skip that one because <laughs> it's too complicated. <laughs> All right, let's see. All right, so here's my site in Kentucky. Um, it was hot, so air temperature was around 35 Celsius. Uh, went just below 30 and then uh, started going back up. Interestingly, the surface temperature crossed the air temperature, so it means the surface cooled off uh, pretty fast. And we saw, let's see, it's 43 down to about 29. So I had over a uh, 10 degrees Celsius change. This was a grassy area. 
what was interesting, now this is uh, all the observations in Kentucky and Tennessee. I found this amazing. Um, see the scattered and the clear. You can see how the, the clouds were increasing. And then when the eclipse came, they decreased. And then after about 30 minutes after totality, clouds started to increase again. So this was an interesting uh, observation. And this was averaging a couple hundred sites. So this is pretty impressive that this, it's so clear in Kentucky and Tennessee. May have to do with the type of clouds uh, and the fact that it was basically cumulus clouds that were forming little ones. And then in Ohio, I don't have all the data analyzed here, but here's the air temperature drop uh, during the eclipse. And let's see, it went down about three degrees Celsius. Oh, okay, we're gonna skip that one. All right, I did wanna show one of the videos. Let's see if I can find it here. All right, here's a video. Hopefully it streams all right. All right, this is uh, from Wisconsin, University of Wisconsin, and it shows, all right, I'll stop it. We have some thunderstorm clusters here in the center of the country. You know, up in the Michigan and Ohio, I know it was cloudy for some people. Uh, it was partly cloudy here down in Tennessee and Kentucky, and out west was fairly clear. And I can see the dark darkness of the uh, eclipse starting to enter the western side of the United States across the United States. I mean, it's pretty, pretty impressive. Uh, I'm just stopping it. Uh, now, a lot of places I heard, like in South Carolina, it was overcast with the, uh, you know, cumulus clouds. And um, as the totality came, the clouds dissipated. And just in time for people to see, uh, see the eclipse. So let's see, I'll do it again. <clears throat> so they have the clouds, you see the, uh, this is from Go16, by the way, it used to be call, called Go's R before it was launched. You can see it coming across. That's pretty neat. All right. Now one thing, I, I put on uh, the PowerPoint a bunch of other links, and what I found was there's actually a really, there's a lot of fake eclipse videos on the internet right now. Uh, trying to show uh, satellite imagery, and there's one from the moon, and there's all kinds, you know, people do this. I don't know why they do it, but that was a real one uh, from Wisconsin. All right. Uh, I thought maybe uh, to take a minute or two, uh, what did uh, other people observe during the eclipse? And you can put it in the box if you want and type it in, or you can unmute yourself and say what you observe personally. At Huntington, West Virginia, we were in the 90% area of the eclipse, and we actually flew a drone hoping to see more of a difference in the light, and we were a little bit disappointed in that aspect of it. Um, we were also taking surface temperatures, and I have to confess, we haven't put our data in yet, Kevin, but I promise we're going to. That's going to be the basis of our project this time. Okay. Uh, so, but the drone was kind of a disappointment, but it was more like a twilight sort of effect at 90%. Mm -hmm. uh, Kevin, you know, we were down in Lebanon, Tennessee, and ironically, uh, you know, J uh, Jim Fitzgerald from uh, NASA guy um, Cleveland there, uh, he was across the street and with his fancy stuff, he's got, he, he recorded what we could see but it was amazing for us because it was, I would say about a 12 degree drop in temperature and it got a ghostly gray and then it was dark. And even with my cell phone, we got some pretty phenomenal pictures. Um, the crickets came out, the air smelled different. And the funniest, <laughs> the funniest thing, we were in Cedars of Lebanon State Park and this uh, little boy was standing in the pickup truck and he goes, it's the apocalypse. 
<laughs> and they were all laughing. And this, this um, my my grandson turns around and says, nope, there's no zombies here. But it was really phenomenal because you could see, you know, like it was basically taking a bite out of the, it looked like a bite out of the sun at a time. And definitely, definitely worth the trip down there to see it. No, thanks, Connie. Uh, we have Diana uh, put in the box, uh, the chat box at Crestwood High School in Michigan. Um, it looked like a storm was moving in. Uh, in Colorado at 92%. They had a, oh, that's a big drop in temperature. I was wondering if the drop in air, and I think it, I'm thinking you're saying that's air temperature, Vicki, um, has to do with also the humidity of the air. So that might be something of interest to look into. Uh, Melody, uh, second day of school for them. Uh, student data was kind of sketchy. <laughs> well, that's always the case. <laughs> uh, John Tiller was at Tennessee State University football stadium with 1,500 people. That's cool. Uh, they observed Bailey beads and diamond ring. Uh, temperature drop about 10 degrees. Now, is that Celsius or Fahrenheit? So that's a, always the question, right? Always. I, I tell my students always to use their units. And then Sarah was lucky, uh, it was mostly clear in Kentucky. She was in Kentucky as well. Uh, Fahrenheit for John, yeah. Okay, well cool. 75% um, in New Jersey, three degree temperature drop there in Fahrenheit. Well, yeah, everybody's got stories here. And Laura at Star Start High School. Uh, it seems like it's going to rain here, but we had three administrators join us, and they're impressed. They're collecting data. Uh, excellent. Um, wow, everybody's posting stuff. It's actually, well, 104 degrees at Hopkinsville Community College. Went down to 84. Hampton, Virginia, two to three degrees Celsius drop. Yeah, excellent. So, you know, there's a lot of good data, and uh, Ishvak, he's on the call right now. So uh, I think he's going to, I hope I'm going to get him to keep working on it, <laughs> ask him nicely, <laughs> and, uh, you know, see what we can get, uh, get out of the data. Um, the one thing that, you know, we do have another eclipse coming in six and a half years, and uh, if you can go to Totality, I think it's worth it. The difference between you know, like 90% coverage in totality was pretty, um, you know, impactful as, as far as, you know, when, when everything kind of goes dark. And where I was, the crickets actually stopped. So it became silent during totality uh, versus some people said that uh, crickets came out uh, during totality. So I thought that was interesting, depending on where you were. Okay, so uh, we're going to switch uh, gears. Uh, you can keep reading. Um, your uh, party in Buffalo, yeah, my parents' house. Uh, I already got dibs on uh, <laughs> my old bedroom, <laughs> my parents' house. Um, all right, so what was I showing you guys? It's gonna start talking about the urban heat island effect. So uh, we have a field campaign starting here in October. We've been switched, you know, it's been in, in December now for uh, quite a number of years. And we're going to uh, add uh, some seasonality to it. So we want to get some, look, start seeing some seasonality. And what we want people to do is take surface temperature observations. Uh, try to do five observations during each month, October, December, and March. And, you know, we've debated, well, when should we have people do it? And this is kind of a way to, okay, getting uh, students engaged. Five observations is kind of a critical mass of having, you know, five different days. Uh, and so what we're going to do, I'm going to switch it over to, uh, to Rick Sharp from West Virginia, Huntingtonville. Wait, uh oh, <laughs> <laughs> forgot what school, uh, Huntington, West Huntington Virginia. High school. <laughs> All right. Got it. Got it. All right, Rick, uh, I'll turn it over to you and you can talk about how things, uh, you do things at your school. Okay. Is my PowerPoint around by any chance? Were you, did you have any oh, okay. Let me see what I can do. I, I think I forgot about it. Uh, the urban heat island effect is one of the things that we look at. Uh, we're an urban school, but we're located two miles outside of town on a hilltop completely away from the city. So we just selected 
about six surfaces to try to represent um, an urban area. It's not a good representation, but it's still the best we could do since we can't really go to the city to take these. And this is something we've done pretty much every year. And during the eclipse, we took observations every 15 minutes for surface temperatures. We couldn't make all of the surfaces, unfortunately, but uh, I have some graphs on our PowerPoint here in a second if we're able to, to get it going. Okay. Let's see. Am I in control? <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, so no, Rick. Yeah, I have. I have to be in control, Rick. Sorry. <laughs> uh, you professors are all alike. <laughs> That's <laughs> okay. Uh, but anyway, I first of all, just wanted to start out uh, talking about a little bit about surface temperatures and what we do. It is one of the most important protocols for us, and. We are active in working with elementary schools a lot, and this is such a, a nice protocol because it has simple equipment that elementary kids all the way up through whatever level can use and can record the data and can understand precisely the effect of surface temperatures. So it's, uh, it's uh, one of our most important protocols. So next one, please. Uh, and just to uh, familiarize yourself, uh, you do have to define a site when we're doing surface temperatures. The, the Globe Observer app is the only one that allows us to do it pretty much from wherever we are. So you have to define a site, and the site definition sheet really represents all of our protocols. So that has uh, the beginning that pretty much describes the geographic location, the time of day, the longitude, latitude, elevation, and those kinds of data having to do with the location. Then the next part, please. The, then the next part actually describes the site itself, what it's covered with, the size of the site, and how it might deviate from what they consider ideal and any other uh, metadata or extra uh, influences that might have on uh, your surface temperatures. Next, please. And you use an IRT, an infrared thermometer, and it needs to be calibrated once a year and it should be within plus or minus two degrees of what your ice bath should read at zero degrees. Next, please. And just so that you don't have thermal shock, you need to place your infrared thermometer outside to allow the temperature to equilibrate so that you don't have uh, incorrect readings. It needs to be the same temperature of the environment that you're taking the observation. You can wrap it in an oven mitt if you want to deal with that, but I found that to be really more trouble than just simply setting them outside in a container so that they don't get rained on or whatever. Because when we do our observations, we go out regardless of the weather. So uh, if we're at school, we take observations. Next, please. Uh, this is the data sheet itself, and this part of the data sheet has not changed. Uh, the first part of the data sheet, which has to do with cloud coverage, actually has. So if we do the next one, please. Uh, you want to take nine observations and you need to take uh, five to six steps in between. You have to be sure you're using the technique that these pictures illustrate here with the arm being extended and making sure that the, the infrared thermometer is pointed straight down so you're not getting a picture of your shadow or a picture of your own body. Uh, next one, please. This is what has really changed. This is the new cloud uh, coverage sheet. So what I've done is I took the cloud protocol and took the data collection sheet off the cloud protocol and put it in replace of the protocol, the cloud protocol on the cloud surface temperature data sheet. Because when you enter data, as we discovered, if you use the old one, it's asking you questions that are more detailed and having to do with the transparency and the color of the sky. And it breaks the clouds down into which particular level and what percentage of coverage is on each one. So if you don't do this, you're going to end up either not having the data to put in or you're going to have to basically guess at it. And of course, included in this app is also a surface tip or the air temperature as well as the relative humidity and the barometric pressure. And I personally, I have a Kestrel that I was lucky enough to get from a weather class. So I use a Kestrel to collect mine um, just simply to avoid the airport effect and the uncertainty of, uh, of a correct reading. Next one, please. Okay, this is what the app actually looks like. If you haven't used this, uh, this is one of the most phenomenal tools and best received tools that we've had since I've been 
working with Globe, quite honestly. Uh, everybody gets enthusiastic about it, and you end up having more observations with the idea of being creating citizen scientists. And we know how quickly the cloud coverage can change if uh, you do surface temperatures like we do. We go out six periods a day, so we're going out about every hour or so and taking the observations. And the clouds change so rapidly and they change so completely that uh, if you're not taking observations as often as you can, you're missing a lot of information. And if you're not familiar with it, there's also the schools application where uh, if you join this uh, on the GLOBE website, uh, NASA will send you the photograph that their satellite took and the observations their satellite took and put it right next to your observation so you can compare and you can at least see how well you're doing on estimating the cloud coverage because the NASA satellites measure that pretty accurately. Uh, we do a little bit less than that. So it lets us uh, see how well we're estimating if it does nothing else. Next, please. Uh, the other thing is uh, if you're involved in, uh, you know, if you're in a department that has a biology department, as all of them do, uh, the mosquito habitat mapper is one that has been well received by our biology department. Now, we got it the wrong time of year. We just started using it, so we're really looking forward to using it starting next year. It's almost uh, out of the season here with us, so uh, consequently, we didn't get to do that quite as much. Um, and you can see from the apps there and the buttons there that you can uh, check the satellite flyover. So if you're looking specifically to take observations when the satellites are there, you can know precisely when you need to go out and do it. But they come over often enough that if you just simply go out, you're going to get quite a few of them as it stands. At least that's been our experience. Next, please. Um, so one of the things that begins with every project is your context inquiry. So the extra data on air temperature and barometric pressure and relative humidity adds some more variables into our uh, question bank that allows us to ask a few more questions and develop a few more relationships and be able to see what other correlations there are between surface temperature and, and other variables. Um, I like it also because it doesn't draw a great distinction between contrails and cirrus clouds. And in fact, if you go out every period as we do, it, you can tell what began as a contrail and gradually became a cirrus cloud. And it really becomes difficult to tell. And I guess from a, meteorological standpoint or a you know, scientific standpoint, there probably is little difference. Next one, please. Uh, I use this quite a bit, the cloud triangle, because it illustrates the three basic types of clouds very well, and it also illustrates their location with uh, the two lower levels and stratus and cumulus, and then cirrus being the upper uh, level of the atmosphere, upwards of 20, 25, 30,000 feet. And then, the prefixes of alto, which uh, set our medium altitude clouds. And then you just simply add the stratus, uh, pardon me, the nimbus or the nimbo prefix. And that takes care of basically every type of cloud, at least in terms of altitude. The other thing, of course, that determines what your cloud uh, is formed is its shape. So next one, please. And these are just some examples of what the clouds look like, the main shapes, and we're all very familiar with these, uh, with cumulus, stratus, and cirrus. Next one, please. And these are the high clouds, as illustrated by the, the cloud pyramid there. And cirrus stratus is probably one of the most difficult to diagnose, but if on your cloud app, there is a cloud key that was put together by Tina Cartwright and I think a few other people that will help you determine whether it's cirrostratus or altostratus, and the same with cirrocumulus and altocumulus. Next one, please. And these are the mid-level clouds with altostratus and altocumulus. These are the only two types. And if you look at the altocumulus, you can see the size of the, the puff balls. They're starting to line up in rows, and they're large as your fist. That's the difference between altocumulus and the out than the um, cirrocumulus because it becomes smaller and smaller the higher in the atmosphere you go. Next one, please. And then these are the lower level clouds that we're all really familiar with, and we've had a lot of those through uh, August if we were taking any observations during that time. 
we were at Huntington High School because we went back to school on August the 8th. So we started collecting surface temperatures early so that we could prepare for the eclipse to have the data prior to the eclipse so that, uh, and I could also get my students trained in how to handle the data and how to take the observations. So um, cumulus clouds were very prevalent at that time. And then stratus and stratocumulus are predominantly the types of clouds we get in Huntington. Next one, please. Uh, this is uh, the diagram on the left. This is uh, it's a terrible picture, I realize, but that's the only way I can make the graph appear because I'm not as good with Excel as, as uh, some other people are. But we took these uh, during the eclipse, and this is asphalt. And if you look, if you can pick out the uh, diagram there, it starts at about 52 degrees and drops down to 44 degrees. So we had an eight degree drop over the course of the eclipse with, um, with asphalt. Next one, please. Uh, this is our football field, and we take it on artificial turf as well. And the uh, temperature there began at 51 degrees, but you can see it actually dropped down to 34 degrees. So that was our biggest temperature drop. We had a 17 degree drop on artificial turf. And this, is, this doesn't surprise me because typically our artificial turf is always our hottest surface. So it doesn't, uh, doesn't surprise me that it would have a, the greatest difference. Uh, this is short grass, although this picture looks like it's a bare field. Um, the, it, it's actually very good short grass. And you see it started at 32 degrees and went to 25 degrees. So there wasn't much of a variance there, at least not like there was with some other surfaces, but that has to do with the albedo and water content and some other factors that make grass a little bit different from asphalt or artificial turf. Uh, how about the next one? Uh, we also use our tennis court because it's a painted surface. And this one started out at 50 degrees and then dropped down to about 38 degrees, uh, 37 I guess, and then came back up to 51 degrees when we had to stop taking uh, temperatures because students insisted on going home when school was out. Uh, not scientists, are they? So uh, tennis court had, had a huge difference uh, along with our uh, football field, and that did surprise me a bit. I thought asphalt would have more of a change than it did. Next one, please. Oops, I get short grass in there twice. Oops, sorry, guys. <laughs> uh, we That's do participate. Right. <laughs> I had to do this in a hurry, so. <laughs> uh, we do participate in Dr. C's surface campaign every year, and it's something that's become uh, uh, really a ritual for us or a baptism of fire because I do make kids go out if we're at school, so it doesn't matter if it's raining, snowing, blowing, what it's doing, we still go out and take surface temperatures. Although we may spoil them this year by taking them out in October, Dr. C. Um, it's not gonna be as tough as they have been. Well, but no, no, but, but also do December. I know you do. We're uh, going yeah, to do it. <laughs> yeah, because we want to do the seasonal effect. We want to get fall, October. We want to have uh, observations in December and then observations in March. So we could have well, all kinds of weather. Well, as you know, I've been, I've been campaigning to have you do it in a warmer time of year anyway. Because <laughs> <laughs> I have to go out six times a day. The kids only have to go out once. <laughs> so uh, anyway, but again, this is a, a big thing for us. And this is uh, usually a at least one of the uh, protocols that several of our students use as we participate in our uh, in the virtual and in the uh, regional science fairs. We didn't get to participate in last year's uh, virtual science fair because our uh, internet blew up on us and we finally had to give up right in the middle of it. Uh, so uh, hopefully we won't have that problem this year. Next one, please. If there is another one. Um, one of the reasons I like uh, the the surface temperature protocol for projects is you get such gorgeous data. Uh, you can do so many different standards and contents for both elementary and high school. You have a lot of different questions that you can use and it just makes for nice clean projects and allows for clean data, which is not always the case in, like in hydrography, which is the other one that I participate in. And last, with Elementary Globe, um, as a Globe trainer and someone who's been a Globe advocate for a long time, um, we thought our best way to improve our science scores was to try to encourage science as much as possible in the elementary schools. So we've been doing it by encouraging Globe and by working with elementary teachers where we have our uh, high school kids, 
have field trips with elementary kids and we take surface temperatures and typically some hydrography observations at the same time. And it just makes for a nice atmosphere and uh, generally a pleasant way to, uh, to do some scientific observation. And uh, the data entry app, um, I haven't had a lot of success with it and I'll tell you why I haven't. It's just simply because we're out in the sunlight. If you're doing surface temperatures and the contrast on the display, it's just simply not enough for us to be able to pick it out easily. So typically what we do is put the information on paper, go into the shade where we can get a contrast and then we enter it on the electronic uh, app so that uh, it allows us to do it quickly and efficiently and still make use of the technology involved. And that's it for us, Kevin. Well, thanks, Rick. Uh, now we should uh, ask, uh, are there questions for Rick on how he does things in his classroom? And um, he either type, up, type them up or uh, say them. I might point out one other thing. I have co-taught classes, so I have kids with IEPs. And so consequently, GLOBE is one of the best uh, vehicles that we have for reaching students that have learning disabilities. It's hands-on, it uh, doesn't involve testing because you're actually grading their work the way they actually perform on the project. And uh, we don't set our groups. We, our groups are chosen at random, so we may or may not have uh, you know, an IEP kid with, uh, with students that are not but it's just something that uh, seems to cross uh, boundaries for us. Great. And that's one of the reasons we use it. Well, that's wonderful. And I see uh, other people have posted things that they uh, have kids with IEPs as well. Uh, I saw a question there on ICE. Uh, uh, typically what I've done with ICE, fortunately we don't have too much of that in Huntington and I haven't had to deal with that very much. What we deal with more than anything else is frost. So we just simply put it under the comments and we just don't mark it wet or dry because it's neither. It's not wet until it thaws. So uh, we just simply note that it was frost covered. And of course, as you would expect, the temperature doesn't change very much until it starts to melt and evaporate. Yeah, and um, I don't know if everybody can see this, if it switches to me or not, but uh, so I have a ruler here. And um, one of the things that, let's see here. There you go. We did a few years ago is we got special rulers that the centimeters and the inches start at the same end. So when the kids put it in the snow, they can read the centimeters and inches together. You know, lots of times these rulers, they have centimeter starts at zero on one, one end, and then you have to flip it over for inches. So we had uh, specially made uh, rulers for that. Of course, I don't have any more except for this one. This is like a collector's item here. <laughs> but that's something, I, maybe that's something we should do again. But that's a, yeah, we do measure snow and that's part of the surface temperature uh, protocol. Okay, so can Rick provide the cloud cover cloud type document? That was the one in the few slides. Now, Rick, isn't that just the data sheet for the cloud observations now? Yes, that's, that's all it is. I just went to the cloud protocol. They had updated that data collection sheet. They had not updated the surface temperature sheet yet. So I just simply right. pulled them apart and attached, reattached the cloud protocol sheet to it. Yeah, that might be somebody's fall on this call like me. I don't know. I, I might be partly responsible for not updating the uh, the data sheet. Um, yeah, so, uh, John said he found an IRT at Walmart, and uh, Lowe's has them. Uh, freight, was that uh, what is that called? Hardware freight or something like that. Uh, you can get on, yeah, you can get it. Harbor, that's right. Harbor freight, and you can get them online for like twenty dollars. Now, here's one. This this uh, variety, I. Uh, by, they generally come in from China. Uh, I, there's some patent uh, thing where they are just by, uh, building them now. I don't know if the patent ran out, whoever built, you know, built them. So remember, you want to hold it on length. Oh, I, I'll show that quickly. Let's see. I'll go back to my PowerPoint. Um, yeah, make sure that the IRT meets the specs. 
Uh, Susan sent that, you sent that to me only, but I, I could say it over the, okay. So uh, just a few things to add with, uh, to what Rick was uh, saying. Let's see, did I share? I haven't shared yet. So this is, I, I mess this up all the time. <laughs> There's a reason I'm not a TV meteorologist, right? <laughs> okay, so uh, this is an image uh, from MODIS uh, from a number of years ago. And you can see the red cities, Detroit showing up. This is the urban heat island effect. Uh, Toronto, Buffalo, uh, let's see, I'm gonna guess it's Syracuse. Youngstown. Oh, Youngstown. Yeah, Pen uh, Pittsburgh, Cleveland, Akron. Uh, you know, and the lakes are cool. This was on uh, April 15th. So, was, you know, lakes are blue because they're cool. And actually farmland is showing up as red as well in this image when it was bare. Farmland is pretty warm. Um, here's a close up of, this is, these are Landsat scenes, by the way, from the Sally Landsat. And you can see very clearly the urban heat island effect from Toronto around Lake Ontario. You even have ha uh, Hamilton down here. Uh, what's this, Niagara-on-the-Lake, St. Catharines. Um, then I went to uh, Wonderground, the Weather Underground, and uh, now this is in Fahrenheit, this was from February 13th, and, um, but you can see, you know, out in the outlying areas, temperatures in the teens, and this is a citizen science, you know, the Weather Underground has all these people submitting data, and then temperatures in the city, in the 20s, now close to the lake, that could be the lake influence, you know, the warm water of the lake, uh, keeping it warmer there. But here are away from the lake and you're in the 20s, on either side, you're in the teens. So we have the urban heat island effect uh, for the air. Oh, this is my kid's school. Uh, one of the few schools that has sewage uh, settling ponds uh, just, out, just on the other side of the football stadium. Uh, and last week, the wind blew for a few minutes from that direction. Wasn't the best. But anyway, you can see the, the school itself is warmer on this Landsat scene than uh, all the areas around it, which is interesting. Even the, the residential neighborhood here is cooler than the school itself. Uh, actually, this is kind of screaming for the school to get renovated so it's not losing heat out the roof during the winter. Um, so that's something else there. Uh, you know, there's some impacts of the urban heat on. Uh, energy consumption is up uh, for air conditioning uh, in the summer. Uh, you get more ozone, so surface ozone, which is bad. And then um, there's human health uh, impacts and increased death rate during heat waves. All right. Well, I was going to look at the chat, but I'm sure. <clears throat> okay, people are just posting uh, where the IRTs from. Okay. Uh, here's something else that shows. The temperature in Celsius, or Celsius and Fahrenheit on the x-axis and on the y is the electric load. And you see right around, um, let's say, 78 degrees Fahrenheit, that's when people start using their AC and the energy usage goes way up. So this you know, puts a strain on the uh, electric grid. Uh, now, as uh, Rick mentioned, you want to have your arm extended. Here's uh, Rick, uh, Matt Fenzel. In India, showing a young boy how to take the observation. You know, you point the instrument at the ground, uh, to take, you know, pull the, the trigger, let go, then tip it up and look at the value. And, you know, when, are, when should you do it? Well, do it anytime you're able to. Uh, we're not real, um, you know, we want it to work into your classroom. Uh, one thing when you do analysis, you may want to look at, well, what time did the other school, if you're looking at, you know, comparing to, comparing two schools, what time did the other school take their observations? And then something that's really uh, maybe a good base uh, approach, and you know, Rick showed this well, take observations of grass and asphalt, so you have a comparison. Uh, I like that artificial turf, that was cool. Uh, shows that on a hot day that the football players are hot. Can I interrupt for just a moment? Uh, has yeah. anybody ever taken uh, surface temperatures in the cooling down phase? That's something I've always wanted to do, but of course we're never in school at that time, so we've never been able to really see how surfaces cool off if they cool at the same rate at which they warm up. I don't know that. Yeah, I would say probably not a lot. Yes, that 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 would be a good study. You know, which uh, surface cools off first, and 
you know, uh, like grass gets dew on it before uh, the paved surfaces do. So generally grass will cool off the fir first. Uh, it has, you know, it's uh, very thin, has a big surface area, so it can cool off the fastest. Here I got a close up picture of the technique. Um, just a couple other things. You want to take nine observations of the same surface, the same cover type, and that's considered one observation because we average the values, the nine values, to get our, our temperature. So in this case, grass, uh, you want to have like the location of the center with a GPS unit. Uh, this is something not to do is, you know, the kids will want to take temperatures of the you know, in this case, the softball field and the grass and the playground, you know, but we want to take nine observations of the grass. And then if you want to do the softball field, nine observations of the softball field, that's a separate site. All right. And here's my son, Timmy. Uh, a few years ago, you know, don't take temperature of your shadow. Don't have the kids do that. Uh, also, you know, we don't have, they, they, they like to have their arm way down like that so they can see the, the values. And of course, then they, might be taking the temperatures of their feet. And I notice I get a lot of temperatures or a lot of pictures of my feet with the cloud app. I <laughs> can see, well, what, what shoes did I wear <laughs> that day? So going back to our field campaign, October, December, and March, uh, it would be really great if you had an urban school and a nearby rural school kind of working together and you could compare the temperature between those two schools. Uh, take observations at least on five different days during the month and maybe grass area or parking lot and, and the parking lot. Okay, now going to, well, hang on. Let me see if there's any questions or any uh, discussion here. Oh, wow, look at all the posts. There's a lot of uh, the cloud data sheet. Lynn, you posted that. Thank you. Uh, Svetlana got an IRT on Amazon. So maybe they'll build a, uh, you know, that's a big competition now for Amazon's distribution center. Everybody wants it near their city or in their city. Are there any questions for Rick? Yeah, Sarah says we'll, we'll send out reminders for the surface temperature campaign. So I'm doing the dramatic pause. All right, well, I'll just, oh. oh. Oh, so Svetlana would like to know what kind of projects have you, you have done. And I will say, Rick, uh, Rick, your students have gone to the White House to present their project, right? Yes, in fact, one of the kids that went, I had an IEP. Uh, uh, that, that's great, that's great. Nobody knew it, and they couldn't pick him out, obviously. But uh, yeah, that was an interesting experience uh, to me. I got into GLOBE just simply because it offered project-based learning, genuine science, and just so many opportunities for, uh, for students to become involved and to learn. And it's, I guess, developed or evolved into almost uh, a career for me as I became a trainer. And it's just taken me to a lot of places that were completely unintended. It just happened. So I feel very lucky. And I'm still the biggest advocate for GLOBE and for the original reason that I joined. Uh, it's genuine science, and we have to create citizen scientists. And GLOBE, for me, is the best vehicle for that. Mm -hmm. Well, that's great. And, and you go out six times a day. So you go out with your kids and do this. Uh, yeah, I do. I, I put in about seven or eight miles on those days that, uh, that we do that. Um, so, uh, but they don't go out if I don't go out. <laughs> I haven't been able to train them that well. <laughs> we did have uh, one school, uh, you know, the kids went outside and they just went home. <laughs> <laughs> I lost the class once, but they didn't go home anyway. <laughs> you lost the class. They went to the wrong parking lot. It's a long uh, story. <laughs> so, so Melody's asking, what grades do you teach? I teach mostly 11th and 12th. Um, and... Uh, Occasionally, I'll get a 10th or a 9th grader, but I do work with uh, elementary students and elementary uh, kids a lot, and I've done surface temperatures with them all the way down to second grade. Um, again, my favorite protocol by far. It's mine, too. 
<laughs> but mine's, a, mine's an unsolicited testimonial. <laughs> yeah, well, that's wonderful, Rick. Thanks. Uh, I, I should mention that some of the uh, figures I was using uh, today were from the e-training slides. So, you know, Globe has these e-training slides. If you haven't tested them out, they're an opportunity to learn uh, different protocols uh, uh, easily. Um, let me uh, just go back to announcing the student uh, follow-up webinar. It's going to be 1 o'clock on Friday. And uh, here's the U tiny URL. And so you don't have to register to be on. Uh, I, I don't... I think Rick, I think it was, it was the idea was for me to to work with the kids, so I didn't don't think that you're uh, going to be part of that. I don't know if you were planning on it. I I can't be if you want me to. It's up to you. Well, I, I didn't know. Where, where are you planning on it though? That's that's the question. <laughs> well, no, it, it, nobody had mentioned it to me. Okay, well, good. See, that's okay. So I wasn't sure. So. <laughs> Yeah, so don't plan it. You know, you don't have to uh, be on. Um, I'll go over some of the things with the Eclipse and then the, the Server Temperature Field Campaign. Hopefully some kids will ask some questions because uh, that'll be a time, you know, if you want, if your kids are going to come on, you know, have them prepare some questions ahead of time. And they could ask me anything in, involving even, uh, you know, careers in, in science and technology if, if they want. Uh, and just to wrap up, here's all the links. Facebook for Mission Earth. You know, a lot of these things, if you type in globe, it actually comes up first. Mission Earth comes up before the actual globe website on some of these searches. So <laughs> it's okay. Uh, it wasn't intentional. Um, and then uh, we have a YouTube channel where, uh, you know, uh, I don't think we recorded tonight. Whoops. Maybe I should have hit record. But no, anyway, uh, we recorded. Oh, okay. Great. Well, thanks, Janet. Uh, so we put our recorded. Um, you know, webinars on the YouTube site. All right, so everybody, thank you for calling in, and I hope you're able to do some urban heat island observations this October. <laughs>